I want to start, actually, you know, you challenged us in your talk and in what you wrote in Wired to think bigger. So I want to start with each of you, and I'm going to ask you what you think the big opportunity is. And so first is uh, Kaf Jarasa, MD, PhD, extraordinary. He's a rare bird. He is a psychiatrist. He's a neuroscientist. And he's trained as an engineer as well. He's on the faculty at Duke. And um, I want you to tell us what you think the big opportunity is for the future. Yeah, I think the big opportunity is for us to begin to think of the brain as an engineered system. So I'll give an example of what I mean. Let me, let me, if I look out in the crowd and I say, anyone who's excited of voting in the next few weeks, put your hands up. So let me, there we go. Come on, everybody. So, so let me You've got something to vote for. That's right. <laughs> So let me talk about what happened in that. My mouth created pressure waves. The pressure waves traveled through the air and struck your eardrum, your tympanic membrane. That, through the kinocilium and the tympanic cells in your ear, was changed into chemical energy. The chemical energy travels down, changes into electrical energy, travels down your cochlear nucleus, into your superior alveolar nucleus, into your auditory thalamus, and into your cortex, which changed into pitch. For the majority of us on the left side of our brain, that's then changed into words. Those words then become representations. If you're young in the room, perhaps you release some dopamine into your nucleus accumbens and you get excited about voting. If you're a little more seasoned, your hippocampus activates and you remember the first time you voted. And if you're a politician, perhaps your amygdala lights up as you count the number of hands in the room <laughs> and you count the number that are from North Carolina, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or Ohio. This information is then synthesized in your frontal cortex. It releases your motor cortex. Activity travels down your spinal cord, through your brachial plexus, and your hand goes up. And all of that happens within half a second. So as we begin to think about these illnesses, whether it's Alzheimer's or autism, the challenge is we're talking about a system that evolves so quickly and information is processed in multiple areas to generate behavior. You know, the, the first time I heard someone describe the brain that way, I was a junior in college at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And we had invited a speaker and he was one of my childhood heroes. He was a neurosurgeon. He will go unnamed. I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> really good surgeon. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and I got excited about the brain, and I got excited about going off to study the brain. This was an academic pursuit for me. It was an intellectual pursuit until I got to graduate school. And, and while I was in graduate school, one of my family members went missing. And we hired a family and personal investigator, and they found my family member in the alleyway in another continent hallucinating. And it was the first time that I even began to understood my family's difficulties with mental illness, whether it was schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression, and as I sat in grad school learning about genetics, all of the, G the genome-wide association studies were happening, I started to learn about psychiatric genetics, and I spent the next 10 years of my life worried that any given day, I myself could wake up hallucinating or, or, or hearing voices. And, and so I decided to pursue an interest in psychiatry, and as I, I sat there with families who were experiencing some of the same challenges that my family was experiencing, I realized that we just needed a breakthrough in how we think about and how we treat mental illness. That big breakthrough, I think, for me, is going to come through this brain initiative. The, it's the opportunity for engineers to engage in how we think about mental illness, to map out how the brain is processing information in real time, the activity of all of these cells, the promises that one day we'll have a new form of treatment that, becomes, that comes out of reading information from the brain, generating neuroprosthetics in the same way that individuals are now moving their hands by thinking about it. Can we augment brain function in a way that allows those with mental illness to come out of the shadows and to Continue to, to continue to contribute to this great American system. So. That's great. Thank you for that. 